it's almost like we have to be reminded from time to time that Buddhas suffer. That somehow our understanding of what the Dhamma is can get twisted up in the trendiness of meditation and mindfulness in the world today. And we can forget what it is that the Buddha was pointing to or what actually led to his awakening. It was suffering. That's what led to his awakening. So when he initially left, he tried out these great teachers. I mean, he went to the greatest teachers. It would be like Joseph Goldstein is his teacher. He had Jack, Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein. Oh, any teacher that you think of is like his holiness. I mean, who gets an audience with the holy, his holiness? And yet Buddha, Siddhartha, that was his main teacher. Just him and his holiness. He had this capacity. Uh, he had this inner, what's called Dhammachanda. And so he went and found the best teachers in the whole practice. And that's who he practiced with. And in some cases, he was able to achieve states of mind that were stiller than even his teacher could grasp. He could get into sublime states that were so sublime, his teacher couldn't even access some of the things that the Siddhartha could do. But, and they, they asked him, will you stay? You should stay with us, teach with us. I mean, you, you together, we could transform the world. You stay with us. He said, no, nope. because inevitably, you all know this, we all know this, that no matter how still that sit was, it's so temporary. It's, it's so fleeting because within an hour or so, you're back to difficulty. And even if you get really, really still on a retreat, do a long retreat, you go a whole month in stillness, you still gotta hit that airport. At some point, you're gonna get, get out of that retreat center and you are gonna come into that airport. You're gonna deal with traffic. You're gonna deal with hunger pains. You're gonna deal with all kinds of stuff. You know, we are gonna deal with suffering all the time. There's no outside of suffering. So he decided, if you know the story of him, he decided to go the opposite. I'm going into the pain all the way in, deep, deep, deep. Not going to let it mess with me at all. I don't care how bad it gets. I'm not going to let it mess with me. And him and a group of his friends who were studying with those deep teachers, they all left and went and practiced these ascetic practices, deep suffering. And can you bear it? Can you learn to be with it? Can you learn to, to settle with it? Don't push against it. So he went deep in the pain. That didn't cut it either. He was just dying. That's all that was happening. Body getting thin and frail, energies going. He just dying. And then of course, if you remember the story, he had that dream and he, that uh, memory that came up about sitting under a tree while his father was doing this uh, harvesting cer uh, ceremony and he felt still. There was all this stuff going on, but somehow he was still. There was this stillness in the midst of movement. Or as Ajahn Chah says, there is still water, there is moving water, and there is still moving water. And he felt himself still in the midst of all this movement. But you know, it's not significant that he had, I mean, it's significant, but it's not, the big deal isn't that he had this memory. To me, the big deal is he had a memory of this peaceful state 
while he is dying. I mean, there's a, I can't remember the sutta, but there's a sutta where the devas out in the energy, in the ether, were talking about whether or not Buddha was dying, whether he was dead already or not, while he was dying. So he's dying. That's what's happening to him. That's the reality. And in the midst of that, he has this memory. In that memory, he says to himself, Hmm, what is that? How come that was like that? And there's a phrase in the sutta where he says, might there be another way? And in that phrasing, he realizes he's got to get his strength back or he can't practice. So he eats. He goes against the rules that were of his practice and he eats. And he starts eating and getting his strength back. Of course, all his friends see him and they're like, oh, he can't cut it because he's eaten. He gets his strength back and then the rest is history, so to speak, because he ultimately finds the pathway to awakening. So this, this kind of story, I'm starting with that because I want to point to something in Dhamma that what we are aiming for is not just a still mind. Because he did that. He tried that. And he's really good still mind. So if we thought, oh, if I had a more still mind, that would do it. My mind is not still enough. If it were more still, that would do it. No, he had, Siddhartha had the stillest mind. And that didn't do it. So sometimes we get into situations where it's so painful. And it's like, well, we got to just bear the pain. You got to take it, take it, take it. You should just take the pain. We all do that. But yeah, that doesn't work either. There's something that Siddhartha saw after he went off on his own that changed his capacity to awaken. And what I think he saw and what I think he did is what Dhamma really is all about. So a couple of things, you got to frame it here because we live in a very closed loop society, a mind state, it's closed loops. We have certain things we believe in and that's it. We don't believe outside of that. This is right, this is wrong, good and bad. We know who people are, we know all about them, we know what they do. We have everybody pigeonholed in little categories and we go through our lives living within this framing that's very closed loop. In fact, your ordinary mind will keep you in that loop. If something were to come along to you that would go outside of that loop, Maybe you'd have to consider something different. The mind would kick up a storm until you got back in line, until you got back where you're at. And this is what's significant about what happened when the Buddha was dying. He did something outside of the norm, outside of this closed loop rules about how you're supposed to practice. He did something that was more in alignment with him wanting to investigate something. I want to know what this is. So I got to eat and get my strength back. And even though everybody left him, he did it anyway. Now he doesn't have any teachers. He doesn't have any friends. He's sitting there trying something out on his own. He's not even sure this is going to work. But, but he wants to know. How could he be still in the midst of all this stuff going on? And in his actual practice, the cultivation of Dhamma, he began to investigate. So the Buddha investigated his thoughts, lots of them. He had unpleasant thoughts. 
and he had pleasant thoughts. He investigated his thoughts around harm and he investigated what happened when his thoughts were non-harming. Investigated when they were full of hatred, when they were full of greed, when they were deluded, and when they were not full of greed, hatred, delusion. He investigated whether or not uh, the nature of a present moment to begin to understand that there's always this moving, moving, a Nietzsche and this uh, sense of dukkha, dissatisfaction and the anatta. This was not just told to him. This was him investigating and coming to an understanding. And when he came to that understanding for himself, he learned some stuff. And eventually, I think what he investigated and learned was that suffering exists all the time. All the time in this human realm, suffering exists all the time. So that normal suffering, he probably had back pain. I mean, he's laying outside. It's hot where he's at. So he probably was sweating to beat the man. They didn't have air conditioning. It's dark. He got to deal with animals. He got to deal with all kinds of stuff that you and I, we don't deal with. We've got it all like shielded and protected. So we don't have to go through any of that. But even with all our protections and I'm shielded, tucked in, I don't have to be outside. If it snows in Seattle, I don't have to go outside. I just stay inside. But even with all my protections, I could look at homeless people and say, oh, my God, they must be suffering because they're dealing with the elements. And they're probably looking at me saying, oh, my God, she's probably suffering because she got to deal with a mortgage. She got to deal with rent. She got to deal with things breaking. I don't have to deal with any of that. So there's a way in which no matter what we do, we're still in this box that's closed loop. And the mind keeps us in that. So what we are looking for is something that gets us out of that out of that contained box. And I think what the Buddha saw was that the way to get out of it was through this doorway of suffering. It's through the doorway of suffering. It's almost like you have to be grateful that suffering has graced itself into your world. Because without it, you cannot awaken. And what you're awakening to is not somehow you're going to get rid of the bad stuff from happening to you. Because if that were possible, he could have did that. But clearly, even after he became awakened, he still had to deal with a bad back from all those years of laying on roots and on the ground and starving himself. And I'm sure his body took a beating during his Jane practice. And so he had to deal with it. He had food poisoning at times because people would give alms and sometimes the food just was not quite cooked right or overcooked or whatever it was, but he had food poisoning sometimes. He had to deal with bad back weariness, same stuff we deal with. He had to deal with stuff in his mind when, he, before he got enlightened, he had agitated mind just like you and me, annoyed mind just like you and me, averse mind just like you and me. And the reason why we know he had those mind states is because he taught us how to practice with them. So if he didn't have them, he wouldn't have mentioned those but he mentioned it because he had to deal with it too. So when you see yourself in the hindrances in practice, that's not, doesn't say anything about you. That says, oh, you're a practitioner because how do we know about the hindrances? Because the Buddha dealt with the hindrances. There's something like 
15 suttas on the hindrances, on various ways to deal with the hindrances and how to deal with them. And that's because he gave many Dhamma talks to many people about trying to deal with the hindrances. Very much a part of practice. Not something that we, if we were good enough, we would be away from them. It is inherent in practice. So we have to begin to appreciate their presence because they might be pointing to something. And ultimately what I think he came to an understanding was that difficulty challenges painfulness in life. That just comes with human birth because we have fragile bodies. We have fragile minds. It's just part of being human. But how we relate to that difficulty is where liberation lies. If you are miserable in whatever state you're in, you're miserable. We know people who have a lot of stuff. They, they got a lot of advantages and yet they are miserable. And you really want to say, why are you miserable? You're messing up the game. The whole point is supposed to get, get this stuff and then we won't be miserable anymore. I look at you and I'm like, dang, even if I got that stuff, I'd still be miserable. We know it. It doesn't work like that. And this was what he saw when he realized he was a kid. He may not have saw it in the fullness of its understanding he got later. But he had this sense that there was a way to be still in the midst of a lot of movement and chaos. That there was something else on this path that could be freed. And it wasn't somehow related to freeing ourselves from conditions. It was within the condition. And so he realized that a lot of his suffering came from his own mind's framing, not from whatever was happening. So he began to question all kinds of things. So if you think of Buddha, the imagery we see of him is like this stoic being that's just sitting there able to take on anything, calm and peaceful. But if you read his suttas, if you read his Dhamma talks, he struggled with a lot of stuff. He had to deal with aggression, just like we do. He had to to investigate this aggression that would rise in his mind. Maybe he was just pissed because all his friends left him and I don't know what to do. He could be pissed that he's hungry. And when you're by yourself, you, it might be less opportunities to eat. Still, people would feed him, I'm sure, as a monk, but still, probably less food. But, and you got to learn to live with it and still practice. So somehow he began to see that a lot of his suffering was not the condition itself. But the second noble truth, this kind of pushing against reality that we do all the time, pushing, shoving, wanting it to be other than what it is, anything other than what it is. And that trying to make it other than what it is, this becomes a problem. It's this clinging to a better life or a better way, or this clinging to the good that's come to you and not letting it go. So we're constantly holding on to it. He saw this, he saw the clinging. And anybody that's ever seen that clinging, it's so subtle. You gotta be still to see it. And even then you're like, geez, I can't even stop myself from doing that. We get on retreats and we see that and we're like, 
I, I, I am judging everybody and I can't stop it. I see myself clinging to wishing the bell was here and thinking about anything more than just this breath. I see all of this and I can't stop it. I see it. He saw it. Same clinging, same struggling, same watching his habit mind. And then eventually he realized that if he let go of the clinging, if he feels that and he softens and softens and softens, gradually he lets go of this clinging. And when he lets go of that clinging, he eventually freed his mind from this constant letting go of that clinging, seeing it, watching it, noticing it. Oh, I see what's happening here. Let go of that. Let go of that. And then he said the fourth noble truth is this eightfold path. So why would he have the eightfold path after you've already done the cessation, right? I see it. This is suffering. The cause of suffering is clinging. I got that. And then there is a way to end suffering, the cessation of suffering. That's good. Third Third truth, and then he goes, and then there's a path that leads to the end of suffering. Well, what does, that doesn't make any sense, but it does. If you realize that the path is actually putting you in a place where you become more sensitive, you see more suffering, see more suffering, then you can see your cause in that suffering, and then you can let that go. And you keep working the path and it keeps showing you, oh, look, there's more suffering, even more. Let go of the clinging in that release and that path. The path is leading you to become more and more and more and more and more sensitive to suffering. You have to see it. Not sensitive to how hard it is to be human. You don't need any meditation to know that. You can know that just by Turn it on the news. I don't know any news channel. Maybe it's because we got 24 hour cable and the only thing that keeps people watching is misery. So if you turn on the news and it's these 24 hours of cable news talking about misery for 24 hours every day, 365 days a year. 10 straight years, 15 years. This is what we've been doing. This is what we've been flooding our minds with every day, all day, looking over the course of the entire world for 24 hours of doom and gloom. And that's what we have, doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom, constantly. So you don't need to meditate to see how much doom and gloom there is out there. That's the easy part. You have to meditate to begin to see how you're holding all that doom and gloom. Because how you're holding that doom and gloom, that's what's affecting you. That's what's causing your misery, your sadness, the mental torment that we go through. And that is what we're trying to unhook trying to unhook ourselves from this constant acting as if it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. And getting so caught in the doom and gloom that you never let yourself cultivate any kind of joy. So even when the Buddha saw the difficulties, he cultivated the support. So he saw his mind getting caught in thoughts about hatred. He cultivated kindness. He saw his mind getting caught into things about uh, harming and he cultivated non-harming. So he didn't just sit there and try to make his mind not think about harmful things. He saw the downside of thinking about these things and he cultivated intentionally 
uplifting mind states. So just a little bit more so we have enough time to share what we're thinking about this. What I think I'm trying to point to is there's three poly words. We don't hardly ever talk about them, but they're very, very, very important in terms of practice. The first one is pariyati, P-A-R-I-Y-A-T-T-I, pariyati. And what pariyati, there are people that are called pariyati monastics. And what they do is they study the Dhamma. They study, 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 study. They're scholars in Dhamma and all of the Buddhist teachings and full of wisdom. And they understand the nature, the nuance. It's like the Pariyati uh, monastics. They know that Abhidhamma backwards and forwards. They're probably the ones that wrote that uh, Abhidhamma. It's the intricacy, if you've ever seen the, the, the um, Abhidhamma, it's very intricate. It's like an economics class, master's level economics class. Like, geez, the charts and the detail and the print is like eight. It's that, that tiny to get it all in one book. Pariyati. So all of us like listening to this Dhamma talk is studying. It's listening to the Dhamma, beginning to understand it. It's like the Buddha having that memory and getting triggered saying, oh, what's that? I like that. What is that? It's that studying that gets the mind. Like, what is Dukkha? What is this? There is Dukkha. How would I know there is Dukkha? Investigating that. Then there is what's called a... Pati Pati, Pati Pata, Pati Pata kind of practitioners. And they are practitioners, monastics who practice the Dhamma. They meditate long hours. They, they sit and feel into whatever's happening. So they, they have some interest about knowing what Dhamma is. And you would practice to feel, to get a sense of what Dhamma is. Pati Pati. And then there's one last word, and that word is Pati Vedi. Pati Vedi is the realization that comes from Dhamma. Whether you study it, whether you practice it, there's these realizations, these insights that come into play and we begin to understand what we're doing here. So sometimes you might be in your practice and you may be in this pati pati kind of place where you're practicing, you know, feeling into everything that's going on and your meditation is great, it's smooth, it's steady. But sometimes you might be uh, in the kind of um, this uh, pariyati, you might be in the studying. So you're taking a class, you're, you're investigating, your interest is getting peaked in it, and you're hanging around with it, seeing it, looking at this, looking at that. And sometimes you might be in this patiwadi kind of uh, place. Um, and that pati weighty is uh, uh, you're having the realization of what's happening. That's this, might there be another way? This realization that comes with Dhamma. We need all three. So if you do a lot of studying and you're not getting any realization, see if you can feel into it a little bit. Fe practice with it. Bring that concept into the mind when you're sitting there and just, just invite it, sort of like, um, how can anatta be known in this moment? What is dukkha? 
and just sit there quietly. You don't have to let your ordinary mind answer it. Let this intuitive sense of yours in practice rise up and answer. Get a sense of it. Begin to question, is this dukkha? Is this dukkha? Where's dukkha? It's mental. It's not physical. It's not conditional. It's what's happening in your mind. So that's what we're trying to look for. And I wanted to encourage us beginning this year to encourage you not to think that practice is just about sitting and meditating. It's way more than that. And you can study some, practice some, but keep recognizing when you're beginning to get some little sparkles of insight, realizations about some of this. Just keep all of that spinning. That's how we stay in the Dhamma for years and years and years. I've been practicing for over 30 years. I'm sure some of you are in the same boat. And I'm just as interested today as I was 30 years ago. I'm interested in different things now. I know some things. So some things I like, I never would have even cared about these three words. But then I started, I, I listened to this Dhamma talk, I think it was by Ajahn Tomato, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, what is that? that that's a whole other field that's opened up. And I started looking all into it and beginning to watch how it is that my practice has unfolded. And if I were to tell you when I started practicing 30 years ago, it was a jumbled mess. Sometimes I practiced, sometimes I didn't even look at my cushion. Sometimes I tried to look at it and I still wouldn't sit down. But then I look back on it and I'm like, oh, I see the ebbing, the flowing. It kind of unfolded like a lotus. It just unfolded and things worked together. So the whole of it is all practice. Your study, your sitting and meditating, your realizations, your contemplations, and realizing what it is you're learning as you uh, go through this whole process. So let's just sit quietly for a moment here. I thank you so much for your kind, kind attention. Appreciate you. Appreciate those of you online that had your camera on. So I look like I'm looking at people. I'm talking to people. <laughs> I appreciate you guys that came into the church and you're sitting there. I appreciate you too. So it just feels like uh, this is a great place to be here practicing together. So thank you. And we'll see if anybody has any comments or questions or anything. I'm pretty open. Very. So I what, think what we'll try to do is to take questions both from here at UU as well as online. So any of you online who have a question or a comment for Tuary, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak. I have a request. Sure. Could you spell the three Pali words? Sure. Thank you. So Pariyati. P A R I Y A T T I and then Pati Pati is P A T I P A T T I and then Pati Wadi is P A T P-A-T-I, and then V-E-D-I. 
DHI. DHI? DHI, yep. Thank you. V as in victory. V E D H I. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I just um, wanted to mention what, when you said that suffering exists all the time. And I was like, yes. And what I've noticed is that my resistance to it um, seems like it's really massive lately and maybe it's always been huge or I'm just now noticing it but um sometimes suffering will occur and I'll be like oh well I'm not going to deal with that suffering because I've been dealing with 10 others in yeah. the last five minutes but it's like all of it right yes but what what I think the Buddha realized as possible so so the way you're framing this is, this is more like the Jane's work, right? Oh, so much suffering, I gotta hold all of it, bear it all, take it all on. That is more like the Jane's. It's like this suffering into it. What I think the Buddha realized is we can be a lot softer about this. Some of this suffering, you have nothing to do with it. You can't even, you don't have no power in it. So why are you trapped in the overwhelming pain of it when you have no power, none whatsoever? You didn't create it and you can't stop it. I can think about, my son actually taught me a, a beautiful understanding about this. It's kind of a strange thing, but my oldest boy went to college and then Thaddeus wouldn't go. And, and, and I kept saying, you got to go. You know how parents are. We're like, you got to go to college, do something. Because if you don't, I'm going to take care of you. And I'm not trying to take care of you. So you got to go. And so he would go to college and he would try to go to college. But he did not like it. He didn't like school. He didn't want to do it. And he's just going to end up failing some grades and, and doing whatever he could. And I keep trying to get him to go. Keep, keep, keep. And we are fighting and arguing. I have, like, I have all this pressure on me. You got to go because I don't want to take care of you. And if you don't go to college, you're not going to get a finance. You're not going to get even a stable level of finance. So you have to go. So this happened all through high school, all through his early 20s. And when he got about 30, about 32 years old, he came to me one day. We've been fighting now. 15 years we've been fighting about this. He wins sometimes and don't go, and I win sometimes and make him go. He comes to me when he's like about 32 years old, and he says, Mama, he has this little picture of when he was a little boy, so cute. He was so, so, so cute. And he's, he's got this little blue shirt on. I remember the whole school year, everything. So he shows me this picture and he goes, see this kid? I'm like, I know, that's my baby. I know. He goes, that is not me. I am not that kid. I am someone else. So now I will go to school and make you happy, but I won't be happy. And I'll do that just for you. But you could also let me be happy and be who I am. And all he wanted to do was play music and wash dishes. He just do a wash dish, dishwasher job just to pay the rent so he could go and play music. That's all he wanted to do. And I'm trying to get him to go to college, be a music therapist or something, but do something that's going to get you some money. He just wanted to wash dishes so he could be in the back of the kitchen. Ain't nobody messing with him. He's just back there washing his dishes. Leave me alone. I'm going home. I don't have no responsibilities. Just give me the dishes and I'm done. So he tells me, I will go to college if that's what you want. It'll make you happy. I'll probably be miserable the whole time. Or you could let me be happy, do my own life, and trust I can do it on my own. 
I'm like, don't you think you could do a no? Don't you think you could be happy if you went to school? He's like, no. So that's your choice. I'm not going to be happy if I have to go to college. So I let it go. I said, okay. You don't have to go to college. I don't know. Maybe you'll go when you're older. I don't know, but you go if you want to. You know, I'm not going to, we're not going to talk about it anymore. I'm going to let you go. You are off the hook. I want you to be happy. And if dishwashing and playing piano is going to make you happy, okay, fine. That's what we're going to do. I don't know why to this day. I don't know why. I agreed to let it go. I don't know why. But we found out two years later, he had pancreatic cancer and he was going to die in a few years. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I can see me being the kind of mama that would have made him go through those two years in college, suffering all the way through, and he still would have found out he had to go, he had pancreatic cancer. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that when we come in line with the truth of the way things are, some sufferings, they are difficult to hold, but they are not ours. We did not make it. We cannot stop it. We cannot, we cannot, um, we can have maybe some minor connection with it, but the bigger, these, these global sufferings, the thing that we can do is how do I hold this difficulty in compassion? That's it. How do I transform it into a garden of flowers? But the garbage, we, you can't make a distinction with that. So some of these global things that are happening, coming our way, we're in a big panic. The mind is trying to control this. I got to control it. If I control it, then we're going to be okay. No. You're going to do what you can. That's it. You do what you can. And the rest of it is something that we learn to live with. We learn to hold. We, we, we learn to live with it as part of life. And that's what we did. I mean, Thaddeus and I have laughed about how close I came to choosing, you got to go to college. Okay, you go to college because I think when you're done, you're going to thank me and you're going to be happy. I think that's what my thoughts were. I think you should go and then we'll, it'll all work out in the wash. But no, I didn't do that. I didn't choose that. I don't know why. But I am grateful to God that I did not make him go to school. That I actually let him choose whatever it is he wanted to do. And so he spent the last of his years happy playing piano, doing what he wanted to do. But I can see where my natural tendency as a parent to control him could have went the other way. So this is what you're, we're, the point of Dhamma is to help us see when we are pushing and trying to make life be a certain way, thinking that our way is the right way. And when we let go and say, oh, I see, this is one of those things where I ain't got nothing in it. What Buddha saw, I think, when he had the memory of his childhood was that his father was doing all that ceremonial chaos stuff. And he was just sitting separate from that still, but still part of it because he was in the same space of it. So, yes, I'm still part of all of these international wars and harms that are happening all over the place. But I'm not overwhelmed with this responsibility that I have to fix it. I can see that a lot of these leaders are not listening to me. They're not listening to nobody. They seem to be having their own little thing going on. So I see, and in my Younger years, I did a lot of protesting all the time during the Iraq war, I protest all the time. I don't have the same energy level or capacity that I had then, but it's okay. I still do my little part. I still feel engaged and connected to it. I don't feel as though I'm like ignoring it. You see? So it's, it's making sure that even though there's a lot of 
conditional harm out there and conditional pain that's waiting on our shoulders, make sure that you are not just wallowing in all that pain and that you are recognizing what is this conditional pain doing to me? And how can I free myself to be able to be with all this in joy? Because, you know, the Buddhist monks and nuns, they were considered the happy ones. That's how he distinguished his practitioners from all the rest of the monks and nuns that were walking around all over the place. It's because they were called the happy ones. So they didn't have any food. They didn't have any, carry any money. They ate whatever people gave them, whatever was offered to them, but they cultivated an inner joy with whatever the conditions were, they were gonna have this inner joy. And so that's, that's what made them stand out from other monastics. Like why is Buddhist people so happy? And it's because they were freeing their minds from carrying the responsibility of fixing all harm. And instead, watching how they're relating to it. You see what I'm pointing to? I know that's a lot. Sometimes I get these really long answers. I don't know. It's like I, I, I hear something much broader in what can be said. So, and there was no other hands up. So I figured I could just talk as long as I wanted to. <laughs> Thanks, Tuiri. Um, we have time for maybe a one or two more questions. Anybody here have a question or comment? Or anybody online? Yes, I will tell you one other thing. So when you hear a Dhamma talk like I gave tonight, you don't have anything to say. I'm used to this. It's too... You're in a contemplative state is what it is. Your minds are like possibility of awakening is, is present. That's what's happening. So sometimes asking a question or giving a comment, that's why I go on and on on answers because sometimes that asking a question or giving a comment, it's, it's, it's too ordinary for where your mind is. You gotta digest this a little. Consider what it is that you just heard. What does this mean in my ordinary life? And so that's that's where I think a lot of you are. And so there's no need to think that we need to have any kind of comments. Thanks, thanks to Ari. We did have one other question or comment. I'm gonna give the mic to this young man. Okie dokie. Thank you for your words tonight. Yeah, um, you are I have been watching you up there, looking at your bookshelf behind you, wanting to know what all the books are. Can <laughs> you, and that's going to be my question. Can you go back there and pick out two books that made you go, mm, oh my goodness. Sit with you well and just bring them back and show them to us so we can see what they are. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> no. <laughs> have some fun. See, what would I, say? I know there's some goodies back there. <laughs> they're, they're all dumb. They're all dumb. This one, I'd say, is probably one of the best. Ah, this one. These two. Okay, these two are the books I would pick. Really get the juices flowing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna turn this light on a little bit here. So one is the island. This is called the island. It's by uh, uh, Ajahn Amaro. Oh, I didn't know that's right. He had a uh, Pisano also, but it's called the island. Um, it's it, it's just a um, it's a book about how to practice, how to how to. It's it's it's. Uh, It has a lot of Dhamma, it explains a lot about the Dhamma, but it helps understand some of these subtle states we get in, like what's happening to you? I can tell what's happening to you. 
the quiet. I can feel it even though we're online. I can feel that stillness and that this is what this book is pointing to. And then this book, Seeing That Freeze, mm -hmm. actually me and um, Brian LeSage are gonna do a year long uh, retreat, uh, not retreat, but year long class at BCBS on this book. This is probably to me, one of the best books on dependent origination. Uh, it's by Rob Babia. Dependent origination, emptiness, non-self, and uh, uh, the five aggregates. It's such a, uh, uh, it's like for people that want to get deeper into the Dhamma study of it beyond just um, your meditation practice. And so those two books are both very, they were, they were both uh, very engaging to me. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Never had anybody ask me something like that. <laughs> it's great. Too so yeah, someone go ahead. asked me if I would sing the meta chant for you guys. Um, I said I would. I don't know how it's going to sound on Zoom, but I can still do it. I think we have a little time for it if you want me to do it. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> I was the one who asked you, so oh, yes, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. I thought I was like, so I can't remember. I got an email that someone asked. <laughs> so that's where it was. Good. That's right. So maybe we'll end that way by sending Meta. So the way I do it, this is Thich Nhat Hans Meta. And uh, he did it just uh, I and you and we, his group, and I do, I add they. Somehow I felt like saying we didn't really capture all the people that I have othering energies to. And so I add they in there also. So let's do this uh, chant. And if you know it, you can follow along also. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be happy. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be happy. May they be filled with loving kindness. May they be May they be peaceful and at ease. May they be happy. May they be filled with loving kindness. May they be well. May they be peaceful and at ease. May they 
be happy. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful and at May we be happy. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful and at ease. May we be happy.